Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Ushanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Ушанка Show. Today we are returning to the topic of OBHSS, Soviet police fighting against economic and financial crimes. And we're gonna talk about хлопковое дело, or they call it узбекское дело, cotton case, or Uzbekistan case. Well, at that time, it was Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, so we didn't really call it Uzbekistan. So Uzbekskaya Uzbek case or cotton case. But before we start digging into the cotton case, we need to learn a new Russian word or more be like Soviet word, pripiska. So you can translate it as a doctor records, but usually pripiska, if you uh, Приписываешь something, if you, so that's like you record additional data. So usually, Припис command that if you pr- produced one ton of cotton in this case, you're gonna write down that you produced 1.2 tons. So this is Приписка, when you blow up, you make it a larger number than actual number that you produced. So that was a Quite a popular way of uh, cooking books or doctoring your records in Soviet Union. In order to get uh, additional payments or awards, you actually make uh, things look better using Pripiska. So on papers, you were doing way better than in reality. And for those of my viewers that are trying to learn Russian, uh, please make sure you don't confuse Pripiska, doctored records, with Прописка, which it's your allotted place of living. So in Soviet Union, and I covered that topic in my video number 24. So every Soviet citizen had to have Прописка, had a place of uh, his location that was recorded in in his passport. So everyone had a stamp in the passport called Прописка, which were recorded that that such and such person, such and such comrade, lived in this specific address. So that's Propiska, P-R-O, Piska. And Pripiska is P-R-I. So words are very similar, but it's totally different meaning. And today we're talking about Pripiska. So Chlopkova Diela, Cotton Case, Uzbek Case, and later when more and more details where on Earth some investigators started calling it Kremlin case, so it kind of gives you a hint how far it went. It started sometimes in 70s, probably like early and mid 70s, and it was going on through 80s. The actual investigation started in 1984 with Andropov and KGB helping OBHSS and Investigation lasted all the way into 1989, so we're talking roughly almost 20 years of cotton case going and then investigations going. Huge, huge, big case. So the location of this cotton case was mainly happening in a country that currently is called Uzbekistan. During the Soviet Union, it was called Uzbekskaya Soviet Socialist Republic, so Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. It's one of the southern, more like Central Asian republics. It's size, roughly the size of California. Uzbekistan actually had a quite an interesting history, and if you're curious, you can uh, look it up in Wikipedia. They have a, a lot of those things are covered. I don't want just to repeat Wikipedia. Um, what I found interesting is you know, during the Soviet Union, we had a lot of uh, articles and TV shows talking how the United States or uh, Great Britain, uh, they turn third world uh, countries into so-called banana republics. Well, guess what? Moscow turned Uzbekistan into kind of like banana republic, but that was a cotton republic. So they were desperately needed cotton for producing clothing, uh, fabrics, and whatsoever. And that was pretty much the only republic that had uh, climate conditions and soil conditions to grow cotton. 
So in 70s there was a major push to increase production of cotton and Uzbekistan was pretty much they were pushing down orchards, gardens and planting cotton almost everywhere. As a result they used a lot of water uh, from two major rivers Sir Sirdarya and Amudarya. And if you look at the map those are two major rivers that feed Aral Sea. So they used so much water so rivers basically didn't make it to the Aral Sea and as a result Aral Sea started shrinking and right now if you look at the map the roughly I think like 10% of actual it's not actually a sea it's more like a inland lake but it has a salt water just like Dead Sea uh, in Israel or Caspi Sea. So this Soviet push to maximize cotton production destroyed Aral Sea, polluted the soil with heavy usage of pesticides and fertilizers. They have a horrible soil contamination. So right now Uzbekistan is paying high price uh, for those good old Soviet days. And another quick side note, if you guys remember several years ago there was a quite a big uh, fiasco happened in Wells uh, Far uh, Fargo Bank and there was the situation when upper management in order to please investors and push up the share prices they were really pushing hardcore in all their branches to load up customers with additional services so they had a target that every customer of Wells Fargo Bank should have at least five different accounts which is which is hardcore right so if you don't meet the quota and your in your branch you'll get fired you got let go so what started happening Wells Fargo personnel started just adding bank accounts uh, to customers without even their knowledge they first used up all their relatives and they were adding themselves bank accounts and then they went off to customers because they wanted to protect their job their income so they were doing prepiskas right kind of like similar things so quite similar thing happened in Uzbekistan because Moscow was pushing so hard to increase production of cotton so cotton key is big picture Moscow which means Leonid Brezhnev really wanted to increase cotton production so they were pushing the communist leader of Uzbekistan Sharaf Rashidov to increase production so Rashidov who of course wanted to keep his position started pushing down the chain to local communist leaders and then of course all the way down to the collective farm leaders about increasing the cotton production so of course first reaction was they started increasing the areas of planting cotton then when it was time to harvest they didn't have enough equipment so they were just using anybody who had two hands and two legs or at least one leg to go and harvest by hand the cotton in the fall so schools uh, pupils they didn't attend school they were sent to the fields pregnant women college students people from the cities everyone had was forced to go and hand pick cotton to meet this quota so they drastically increased cotton production something to like 4 million tons per year but Moscow wanted even more so Brezhnev asked Rashidov Komar Rashidov is there any way you can do five and a half million ton and Komar Rashidov said yes we can so pretty much what started happening so down to the chain of command there was the message I don't care what you do I need five and a half million tons of cotton so he went all the way down to a collective farm and if collective farm produced for example 10 tons they said we don't care you need to produce 15 tons and that's when Pripiska started they started changing paperwork and reporting that yes we produce so much cotton and then of course you send cotton to be processed so now you got to talk to those people and explain the situation why on the paper said that you shipped 15 ton although only 10 times arrived arrived and then bribes started so eventually 
by mid 70s early 80s there was this bizarre self-feeding system got created which involved uzbekistan communist leadership moscow and then of course collective farism and uh, local leaders in uzbekistan because they reported harvests way higher than actually happened moscow paid for all those paper cotton that never existed money that moscow paid got split and went to bribe around then those bribes started working back up in the chain to pay people to keep their mouth shut and then these bribes were kind of returning back to moscow so i call it like this interesting soviet 69 situation when both parties uzbekistan and moscow were satisfying each other by circulating the money and stealing pretty much from the state in fact comrade brezhnev was very very pleased extremely happy to announce to the whole world that look the socialist collective farms are way more effective than any farms in america because look at the amount of cotton we produce so like we show this insane insane amount of cotton coming out from uzbekistan so they were very proud to show their successes in moscow and that was one of the reasons why although there were first kind of things were happening first maybe questions because you know kgb could notice here and there obhss could catch some kind of things that something was going on but because Comrade Brezhnev was really happy. No one wanted to make him upset and uh, tell him what's happening in reality. So nothing was going on all the way to 1984 when Brezhnev passed away. I think Brezhnev died in 83 and Andropov, former KGB leader, became a leader of the Soviet Union. So let's take a quick look to understand how this Soviet 69 was working between Moscow and Uzbekistan. So, Kalhoz reports that they harvested 15 million, 15 million, 15 tons of cotton, and they get paid for 15 tons of cotton. In reality, they produced only 10. So, they got extra money for 5 tons of cotton, and I guess it was a lot of money. So, now trucks are taking cotton to the processing factory, and they take a case with cash to pay manager of the factory uh, paid the uh, chief engineer chief technologist to close eyes that they got less cotton that on, on the paper so of course those priceless so i found out that if they ship by train so for example there'll be 10 cargo cars with cotton one will be empty so the price of it to accept empty uh, cargo car was 10,000 rubles so that was the price tag to process invisible cotton so the main headache was actually on these processing plants because they needed somehow to explain why after accepting 15 tons of cotton to process as a result they will produce only you know so much pure cotton which doesn't match their initial 15 tons and so they had to change some kind of like their technology and claim that way more cotton being a loss due, due to the drying process then they had to change the standards so some cotton that used to go to waste because just poor quality now they come up that it still can be used then they actually set up their warehouses on fire so there'll be empty warehouse which suddenly will catch fire by accident and then they'll claim that you know 50 tons of cotton burned down so this is one of the reasons why we didn't produce enough and as i mentioned in one of my previous videos communist party was like a parallel system controlling the economic life of soviet union so every communist leader had to be paid to to keep his eyes closed to the situation because they were aware of what's going on too as i said from the bottom of the collective farmer leader and up to the processing and shipping and then of course it went further to other factories they were using cotton so they were claiming hey we shipped them so much and then they had to claim on some losses 
So this whole system was just recirculating cash, and as a result, Soviet Union, like a state, lost huge amount of money because of these prepiskas that were happening for years. So I said it was discovered around 1984. I mean. They knew about it earlier, but when they started actually doing an investigation, arresting people, they found out that the scale was just enormous, just mind-boggling. So from 1978 to 1983, there were Pripiska around 4.5 million ton of cotton. And picture cotton, 4.5 million ton. Never existed. And then it was still going on later, so total amount was close to 10 million ton of cotton was added and paid. So Soviet state, Soviet government actually lost somewhere around 10 billion rubles in this cotton case, which I don't know how to even translate to dollars, a huge amount of money. According to the records, what I uh, found the ball got rolling, actually, when the KGB arrested uh, local Obechayasets. So the guy, actually, the economic and financial crimes police, the local uh, chief, was arrested, Comrade Muzaffarov, uh, because uh, he demanded 1,000 rubles bribe and some sexual favors for the lady. She got mad and complained to KGB. They arrested the guy. They didn't think nothing like big about it but then when they searched his house they found 1.5 million rubles so they realized there's something really big going on so a guy started singing and they started arresting as a result they sent 3,000 investigators to Uzbekistan they arrested thousands of people close to 4,000 people in the end went to jail Total was around 800 criminal cases, and of course each case involved 20, 40 people. So as I said, out of uh, 800 cases, close to 4,000 people actually were uh, jailed. Quite a few people shot themselves before they got arrested. They confiscated millions of rubles. They were uh, confiscating golden coins. Uh, like one guy, they found 110 kilos of gold. And, you know, it's Uzbekistan, so they were hiding their cash and gold in bidones, so these big uh, aluminum giant jugs for milk. They will just uh, fill them full with gold coins or cash and then bury them. So that was insane. So out of this 4,000 people jailed, there was like 433 Kalhoz or Safhoz managers. So that's the lowest level of people involved. Then you had 85 directors of cotton processing plants. Then you had about 400 deputies, uh, deputates, so the elected officials. Then there was the like a local, I couldn't say company, but it called the God Hlop Prom. So that's the company that handled all the purchases of cotton in Uzbekistan. Every single person there was arrested and jailed. All found guilty, all found taken bribes. First Secretary of the Central Committee of Uzbekistan. All first secretaries of every single region of Uzbekistan. And it went all the way to Moscow. And the top guy that got arrested was Yuri Churbanov, uh, who was the top, like, militia, MVD leader. And he was Brezhnev son-in-law. So this is the chain of command that involved, uh, was working on this corruption. In the beginning of the story, I mentioned Sharaf Rashidov, who was the first secretary of Communist Party of Uzbekistan, and he was a twice hero of the socialist labor. He was one of the Brezhnev's favorite buddies. But when Andropov came to power and started working this Uzbekistan case, Rashidov realized that he's in big trouble and he committed suicide and uh, shot himself. And also, as I mentioned earlier, investigation started in 1984 and went all the way to 1989. So it went through Andropov, then Andropov died. Uh, Chernyanka was at power, Chernyanka died, then Gorbachev came to power. And as I mentioned, uh, one of the uh, chief investigators, 
in this case Glenn, he actually told Gorbachev that you can't call it cotton case or Uzbek case, it's actually Kremlin case. And Gorbachev didn't like that. And uh, they actually, they almost got themselves in trouble. They, there was a criminal case against chief investigators because they were using excessive force or whatever. So they almost got arrested too. So here's a quick and dirty review of the ill-famous Cotton case, Uzbek case, Kremlin case that was happening in the 80s. And it's one of the reasons why I'm keep on telling that you need to be very, very careful and very, very skeptical about any numbers that were produced during the Soviet Union era. Because quite often people, my viewers claim that I'm a liar, that look at the numbers, Soviet Union was doing great here or doing great there, the economy grew, you know, people were happy. This is an example why you shouldn't trust any Soviet statistics, any Soviet numbers, because in Soviet Union numbers carried political weight. So you should be really skeptical about all these numbers because I said, look at this cotton case. We were producing so much cotton on the paper and uh, when reality actually was discovered, it, it was way worse and it was very, very ugly. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something new. And before I say goodbye or dasvidania or dotspitania, I would like to thank everyone who purchased my book, American Diaries. And I want you to ask you and remind you, please post the review on Amazon. It's regardless if you bought it on Amazon or directly from me, if you wanted a signed copy. If you're a customer of Amazon, you can still post the review on the book. So I got over 50 books sold right now, but only six reviews in America and two in Great Britain. So please, if you have a minute, uh, go on Amazon.com and post review for my book. It will be greatly appreciated. And thank you for watching my channel. We'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Hey, by the way, the cool merch for cool comrades is available at the Ushanka store at teespring.com. And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Ushanka show. For as little as one dollar, you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet